Hello, and uh, welcome to this panel discussion on the role of ethical finance. Uh, my name is uh, Andrea Casotto. I am the president of the San Francisco chapter of the Padova alumni. And uh, uh, we have uh, today a speaker from the West Coast, our alumnus uh, Marco Vangelisti. And thank you for uh, uh, joining us from California. I would like to thank uh, all the people who have uh, organized the uh, panel discussion from Ilaria Caputi, Nicolò Spiezia, everybody in the Associazione Alumni, in, and with the Cristina Felicioni and everybody else. Uh, I thank the participants. And uh, now my role is to hand off the microphone to Domenico Lanzilotta, journalist and entrepreneur, who will be the moderator of the panel. I hope you enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrea, for your introduction. And a warm welcome, everybody, to From Profit to Prosperity, the Role of Ethical Finance. Uh, this is the third event of a cycle entitled Rethinking Circular, promoted by the association's alumni and amici of the University of Padua. So we are here to uh, rethink it circular, all together with the great community of the University of Padua and those people who in their careers, uh, in their academic and professional careers, have distinguished themselves in the different fields of circular economy. So uh, before starting, I will quickly recap uh, today's agenda. Uh, to offer us a first uh, overview will be Francesco Bicciato, Secretary General of the Italian Sustainable Investment Forum. Uh, subsequently, uh, new perspectives will be outlined by Professor Alberto Lanzavecchia from the Department of Economics and Management, Marco Fanno, University of Padua, and Marco Vangelisti, founder Essential Knowledge for Transition, um, they will later debate in a panel session uh, that is open to contributions and questions from the public. So um, I encourage you to participate and you can use the chat uh, to send your question. Uh, said so, I think it's time to give the uh, floor, the virtual floor to Francesco Bicciato, uh, which will give us a first series of considerations about sustainable finance and its latest developments. So, to you, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you very much, Domenico. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks for the organizer to invite me. I'm very, very happy because uh, I am graduate and, uh, and a PhD in the University of Padova. So I'm very proud to, to be here with, with you today. Um, okay, so um, first of all, as, as Domenico said, I'm a Secretary General of the Forum for Sustainable Finance. Uh, and now what I propose you is to share my screen in order to show you some slides. Uh, so one second. Okay, here we are. Okay, I think that uh, uh, we can go ahead. Okay, just tell me if everything is okay, if you can see. Everything okay. is fine. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, today we, I would like to, to talk about the, is an overview of sustainable finance, an introduction of sustainable finance from our perspectives. We are a, a center of research and training and advocacy. The Italian Sustainable Investment Forum uh, it has uh, the mission to promote sustainable finance and also to uh, produce applied research for our members, uh, the practitioners of, uh, of SRI industries, or sustainable responsible investment industry. We are a very we we have a very multi stakeholder organization. Take into account that we have from from BlackRock to WWF. So you can imagine that there are a, a big differences among the members of of the forum. Most of them are coming from. Um, the industry of uh, asset management. Uh, of course, there are banks, uh, other institutional investors like banking foundation, 
pension fund, uh, insurance company, and also we have uh, an important component of civil society, like uh, as I mentioned you before, WWF, but also forum of the sector, trade union, uh, and other other uh, non-banking foundations. So I mean that uh, uh, this is a nature of multi-stakeholder organization can allow allow us to to see. The, um, the, 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 the development and the update of, of, of sustainable finance in a very wide perspectives, which is not exactly the right perspective, but it is a very big perspective. So maybe we, we can discuss about that. But um, this is quite interesting. And uh, Another important activities that we are trying to do is the, our advocacy, uh, advocacy role, especially uh, towards uh, Italian institution, the government, uh, and the European Parliament and the Commission, European Commission. We have uh, two, uh, two, two branch, the main one is in Milano, and the other one is in Brussels. Um, with uh, our uh, um, sister organization, Eurosif. Eurosif is uh, an European organization that uh, we can say is composed by different CIFs. CIFs uh, means uh, Sustainable Investment Forum. So we are ITA CIF and with the other friends of the UK, French, uh, Germany, Netherlands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are part of Eurosif, our our European organization. Uh, okay, I would like to to go very uh, quickly to provide you um, the definition that we use uh, to 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 uh, define. I mean that uh, uh, to to have an idea which are the, the most important uh, issues that. Uh, compound the definition of sustainable and responsible investment. Uh, so at the beginning, we say that, uh, OK, investments uh, that aim to create value for investors uh, and uh, um, which uh, they, 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 I, the most important strategy is the mid long term strategy when analyzing enterprises institution and we integrate in from in environmental, social, and governance ESG aspect into the financial analysis. This is the first important thing. I mean, that there is not something complementary, but is something that integrated the economic and financial analysis, which is quite different from, for example, a sustainable report or social report, et cetera, et cetera. So sustainable finance is the uh, define the ESG in the, under the, um, we can say the length of sustainability and uh, the real sustainability. The real sustainability is composed by three uh, aspects, economic and financial, social, and environmental. All these aspects are absolutely crucial in order to uh, maintain an ESG approach and a sustainable approach in, uh, in uh, using the financial tools. This is a very important. Uh, and this definition uh, is uh, quite similar to the definition that uh, um, the action plan of sustainable finance that we, we, we will see later. I mean, that this is uh, an important plan that European Commission produced in, two, in 2018. So more or less, they, they use the same, the same definition. And this definition is created in Italy in, to, in 2013. It is quite important because uh, this definition, of course, uh, the Italian version is uh, used uh, in uh, other countries uh, uh, that, uh, um, that work uh, on, the same, on the same aspects. OK, uh, regarding the ESG, um, here there are many experts, so I don't want to spend too much time in, in, uh, on, on this. But uh, the environmental, the social, and governance aspect are uh, quite important and normally for the environmental aspects, for example, we consider the uh, GAG emissions, uh, the, the, the sustainable water management, uh, the uh, reforestation or deforestation, etc., etc. All the aspects, all the aspects that can be positive or negative for the environment. 
Uh, from the social point of view, of course, uh, we consider respect of human and workers' rights, supply chain, uh, supply chain sustainability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In governance, uh, we consider many, many aspects. Uh, a couple of examples are gender balance from one side and the remuneration policies from the other side. I don't want to spend too much time about that, but just to give you an idea that uh, I mean that the indicators that define what is uh, uh, positive from environmental, social, and governance point of view is uh, there are really a lot of indicators, but this is just uh, to give you a very quick example. Um, what about the strategies? The strategies normally are used in, in, uh, in sustainable finance are these six strategies. The first one are the exclusion. So what I don't, uh, which are the sectors where I I don't want to invest, okay? I try to be very, very simple. And so I exclude from my portfolio some sectors like, for example, weapons, like, for example, tobacco, like, for example, uh, pornography and so on. And so this is quite, it, this is quite important because uh, the strategy of exclusion is the most used, the, 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 the exclusion that the, the strategy that you can often in the decision of the portfolio uh, investors. And um, the issue of exclusion is quite important, but it is a matter to, to, to define what is uh, the divesting. So what, what is quite important is also to understand where I can invest my money. And uh, the other strategy are more or less, uh, they, they, they have this kind of, of, of aim, norms-based screening, uh, is the strategy that are related, linked to the international uh, uh, agreement, for example, uh, like, for example, the ILO, the, the agreement uh, for the respect of the workers, uh, or the universal declaration of uh, protection of child, et cetera, et cetera. But today, uh, the norms-based screening more important are absolutely the SDGs, so the 17 SDGs uh, of the United Nations, and uh, uh, the respect of the objective uh, of the Agenda 2030. And so this is quite important because uh, it is something a little bit uh, innovative and recent, we can say. Okay, I, I would like to, to, to avoid the other, to, to explain in the details the other strategies, just, uh, just uh, to, to, to focus your attention on the strategy of engagement that for us is quite important. I mean, engagement is the dialogue between uh, companies and investors. Um, this kind of dialogue in my point, from my point of view is the success of the sustainable finance or the in success. I mean that the problem is to align the behavior of a, co a company with the behavior and decision of the investors. Align in terms of respect the, for example, SDGs or other principles related to ESG uh, respect. So this is quite important because uh, I mean that just working only on the financial side cannot allow us to take into account to move together with the companies towards the same direction. In my view, this is quite important. So it's, of course, our perspective is from financial side, but from the other side is absolutely important to move together with the, with the with the companies and uh, all, all kinds of companies that agree and share this kind of principles and values. Um, okay, let's give a look at to the advantages and the obstacles of a, a sustainable responsible investments. The first one, the first issue is uh, regarding the ESG risks. I mean that one of the opportunity of sustainable finance is to anticipate which are the negative externalities that, that can be produced by a non-ESG strategy. Um, 
This is quite uh, important. For example, if we uh, if you consider the behavior of some uh, of some uh, player, some important player of uh, of uh, of uh, um, SRI industry, I give you the example. For example, of uh, of uh, uh, insurance companies, uh, the insurance companies that uh, during the uh, agreement th during the COP twenty one in Paris. Uh, um, organized a parallel meeting respect to the, the big conference uh, on climate change. And uh, the result was uh, that, uh, I mean, that they, they understood that was quite convenient, it's more convenient to invest in environment and not to destroy the environment because this caused a lot of problems in terms of uh, loses that uh, the companies uh, can have uh, as a result of climate change uh, adverse uh, adverse uh, event so the problem is that uh, what they understand understood that uh, the investment in sustainable finance convene not only from a social and and and, and the environmental point of view but also from an economic and financial point of view this is a uh, quite important to understand. And the issue to anticipate or mitigate the risk applying the social and environmental approach is quite important for the stability of the investment. I mean, not only for the positive aspect related to environmental and social aspect. So this is quite important because it's quite simple, but normally a little bit revolutionary respect to the approach that they, they have some years before. Uh, the investment opportunities or different sector of opportunities and the returns, as I, I, as I tell you. There are also some barriers, uh, many times lack of harmonization uh, between uh, companies and investors, uh, lack of data. This is one of the most important issue. I mean, that we don't have enough data in order to measure the social environmental impact and so special, special social impact is not is easy to, to, to measure for lack of data and other, other problem. Um, and the perjudice and perjudice, but the, right now I think that uh, we are lose this kind of problem. I mean that uh, now sustainable finance is not more a niche, but it is a mainstream. So this is quite important uh, because uh, there is a sort of cultural jump that uh, that that we did. And this is just uh, just to accept to explain you know some data regarding these are. Uh, uh, MCI um, graphic. Uh, as you can see, the return uh, uh, of the gross return of the MC world SRI. So, I mean, the, the funds uh, SRI respect the traditional uh, found, uh, found non ESG. Okay. As you can see, the blue line is always at the same level, but, in the, but sometimes, uh, especially now, is higher than the other one. So I mean that uh, it, it is a mistake, it is a fake news that uh, sustainable finance is not convenient. I mean that uh, uh, this is quite important because in many, in many, in many cases, uh, there are a lot of, this is just an example, but we can use the Morningstar uh, graphic or, uh, or other, other, uh, other data that confirm more or less the same, uh, the same issue. So, I mean, that is convenient to invest in the in environment, it's convenient to invest in social welfare and so on. And this is quite important. Uh, and uh, in, many, in many cases, the traditional investors uh, uh, the traditional investors uh, uh, have had to change their mind from this point of view because there was something not uh, not common till uh, that moment. This is some data in order to uh, to to explain to you which are the development and the increase of uh, of uh, sustainable investment. If you can see in December in Italy, in this case, in December two thousand and nineteen, we had twenty. 221 funds for 31 billion of assets in December 2020. So just one year after, we have 
116 funds and 81 billions of assets. So you can understand that this kind of increase of sustainable finance is during a very difficult economic and financial and financial uh, context. But in any case, uh, it's quite important to understand that there is a big interest if, from, from investor market, but also from the retail market of this kind of, uh, of, um, of uh, way to, to, to do finance. Okay, um, there is an important role that European Union has uh, right now. We can say that 90% uh, of our, our, our uh, advocacy activities are, are with the European Commission, uh, more than at the national level. Uh, there are uh, some, some moments, say quite a, some moments that we consider absolutely important. The first one is 2018 the launch of the first action plan on financing sustainable growth. This is sort of a revolution, a revolution in, 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 in Europe because before 2018, we didn't have this kind of uh, interest on, on sustainable, sustainable finance. In 2019, uh, we uh, launched in Europe the EU Green Deal. Um, and uh, this is very important because when, when the European Commission launched the Green Deal, considered the green uh, strategy and the green finance as the strategy and, and, the, and the only uh, way to do finance for European Commission. I mean, that is not something that is related to the environment. And then there are other sectors which are more, more important. In this case, European Commission considered the EU Green Deal come the, 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 the green revolution of, of European Commission at that time. When, when, when COVID arrived, and so we, we shift from European Green Deal to next generation EU, we, um, we see a good, a good surprise in my point of view. I mean that all the objectives regarding the sustainable, sustainable uh, development uh, that, uh, that are part of the action plan from, the, uh, from one side, from the EU Green Deal, from the other side, are confirmed in the next generation EU. I mean that now the environment as the focus of the recovery strategy and digitalization and other, but the environment is uh, quite important because it's a confirmation of what we say of, of what we say in 2019. There was a risk. There was a risk that they say, okay, environment is a very important uh, um, uh, sector, but now we have other problems to 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 deal with, and. Uh, so this continuity in the European policy, I think it is quite important. Uh, now in 2021, we have the renewed sustainable fina finance strategy. And this is quite interesting because uh, this one uh, with the new law on climate uh, is considered by European Commission as not a delayed act. So the act that we have to maintain even in a different difficult situation like the pandemic situation that we are living. So this is very important uh, because uh, the central role of sustainable finance and the, and the environment and for the other part of the digitalization are confirmed in, uh, we, we can say in few years, because if, if you consider that in three years, uh, the, from, from, the, from the juridical point of view, change completely, completely the uh, framework uh, regarding these, uh, these aspects. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to, to spend too much time, just, just to tell you which are the main, uh, um, the main um, objective of the, the action plan. The first one is reorient capital flows towards sustainable investment in order to achieve a sustainable and inclusive growth. 
manage uh, financial risk stemming from climate change, environmental degradation, and social issues, fosters transparency and long-termism in financial and economic activity. One of the weakness of the actual plan is that is a green plan. I mean, the social aspects are not very, uh, very important inside of the, inside the plan for many reasons. I mean, that now we, we can discuss about that. And, uh, and this is a problem because of course, uh, um, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about, we, we, we talk about, as I said before, the three aspects, economic, uh, social, and, uh, and, uh, and environmental. And so this is something that we have absolutely to, to, to change. If, if you can imagine, uh, for example, if you take into account, uh, even in, in, the, in the next generation, all the strategy of uh, di digitalization, for example, I mean that uh, this is quite important, technology is quite important, but if you don't have an inclusive digitalization, you have a big problem. In Italy, there are 30% of people that they don't have ac access to internet. So I mean that dig digitalization is very important, but the most important issue is how to access the, the new opportunity of technology, not technology in itself. And the same issue is, uh, I mean, that the social inclusion. I mean, that you can have a fantastic plan in terms of green economy, but if you don't have a social strategy in order to uh, share the, the, the benefits of this, of this, um, of this uh, development, you don't have sustainable development. So I mean that there are uh, problems on the on the on the on the on the on the ground, and so okay, we have to to do something in order to to fill uh, to fill the gap. Francesco, okay, this is the you're running out of your time. Okay, fantastic, and so I I go and uh, uh, very very fast, uh, and uh, uh, I would like um, to just to show you these regular regulatory initiatives uh, which are the most important we have a lot uh, and uh, we have to consider especially the non-financial reporting uh, the the new rule new rule on uh, disclosure and uh, the taxonomy we will have the taxonomy uh, the, the regulation of taxonomy we will have at the beginning of 2022 uh, just a couple of mention of the two most important uh, uh, tool, green bond from one side, a social bond from the other side. I don't have time to explain uh, what we are talking about, but we are, but it's quite interesting because in front of a, a problem that we are, we are facing in this problem, big problem of greenwashing. Alberto, I think that maybe later can so the case speak about that. So the only issue that we can do, for example, when we talk about green bond is to be uh, sure that we are reference to green bond standard and green bond principles that, that can guide a little bit the investment and assure their um, direction towards the, um, the environment uh, sector. Social bond, okay. Social bond are uh, a, 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 a quite important right now. It's very difficult in all, also in this kind. So I, I, I think that not only green washing, but also social washing is a problem that we are facing. Uh, we, have, we have to, to mo monitor very, very quickly. And, uh, but I think that these two tools are quite important to develop the, the, the sector. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry for the for uh, to to be maybe late, late uh, with respect to the time that I had. I would like to to say a lot of things <laughs> because you can imagine this sector is an important sector, and there are a lot of works that we are doing. But it's, it was just to give you an overview. And uh, okay, so thank you very much, and give you the floor back. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, you really outlined the picture uh, so clearly and uh, you gave us an overview of the criteria and the strategies uh, applicable to sustainable and responsible investments. And thank you for reminding us that some uh, roots of sustainable finance lie in Italy. Um, I think it's uh, 
at this time, it's a time uh, in which many paradigms are radically changing. Uh, I therefore want to give the floor to Alberto Lanzavecchia, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of, of Economics, uh, Marco Fanno here at the University of Padova. And I want to ask him to help us understand from his point of view, uh, what role finance can play in establishing a new paradigm of circular economy. To you, Alberto. Thank you, Domenico, and uh, all the organizers for have invited me, and of course, the attendees who are here listening to us. <clears throat> yeah, I, I will uh, take three steps uh, to, to uh, unveil my personal view on, uh, on the big picture we are now designing. And my personal idea is that we are still uh, far away from reaching the prosperity, for reaching the sustainability at large. And uh, to do that, uh, I will uh, start from the, the first step that it is exactly the answer to your question. Uh, as Francesco uh, outlined previously, uh, of course, we have to, to look at finance uh, as a tool for channeling capital uh, from, from private investors towards business and projects that might have a positive impact into society. By positive impact, I mean that a change, a positive change from what is bad to what is better. To, from what it, it is destroying the planet to what it is preserving the planet. And of course, the social impact as well. So the first step we have to, 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 to take is to check whether or not the finance, the capital, the money uh, is moving towards such businesses and not others. This is the, the main role of sustainable finance to connect investors and good businesses. To define a good business, uh, I would uh, link uh, the presentation Francesco made uh, with the general European Union framework. It, it, it was slightly mentioned at the very last slide of his presentation. And by just looking to the website uh, of the European Commission, uh, for me, it is easier than to, to, to copy and paste into a slide. So what I'm going to do uh, is just to share the screen, uh, looking at the, the European Union and, uh, and more precisely the European Commission website, website to define what, according to the European Commission, a sustainable business is. And this is important if we want to use the finance to channel, to move capital towards this business and not to the other that are so far damaging people, damaging the planet. So uh, the key role is to move capital towards what? European Union define a taxonomy, so a general definition on, uh, on good practices, on good businesses or sustainable business at large, where of course it is biased somehow, because uh, as Francesco outlined, uh, as you can see, most of them really are related to the environmental dimension. They are a green economy. It's a, a green economy more than a social uh, economy. But uh, looking at the, because you know the picture here is a sustainable activities, but then you go into the European Union taxonomy and what you find is only an environmental uh, dimension. So we are somehow narrowing the, 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 the positive impacts uh, only looking at the, the planet. We are somehow not including people so far. Anyway, the, the definition here uh, looks at the climate change, adaptation and mitigation, the protection of water, of uh, pollution, the circular economy, it's here, point number four. Uh, it's at the core of our uh, probably uh, webinar. So it is within a bigger picture that is a sustainable uh, business. And, uh, and at the end, uh, the, the protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. So yes, uh, European Union so far, uh, 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 it is targeting mostly the green, uh, the green business, so the impact into planet. Uh, and so far, uh, it has somehow postponed what is written in the treaty of its constitution, the fundamental treaty 
or why European Union exists, namely the social cohesion and uh, the social welfare at the core of why European Union, Union exists. Anyway, so first step here is that we are talking about the European Union, uh, mostly about the green finance. The second step is, okay, uh, how finance enter into this equation? So how can we move from the business as usual towards a more sustainable, uh, uh, to more uh, sustainable one? Uh, here comes the question, uh, uh, Domenico, you addressed to me, that is how finance can be the tool for uh, moving towards uh, a sustainable uh, environment, a sustainable business. Uh, we have to unveil some data that uh, um, Francesco has shown previously. To do that, uh, uh, since I'm an, I do not know how much uh, people attending uh, and, uh, this webinar are aware about how the capital markets works, I will use uh, a, a very simple uh, uh, example. If you want to buy a car, you can buy a, a brand new one so you go directly to a car maker shops. In that case, you are going to buy a car and your money goes from your bank account into the car maker. So you're buying a car, a product in the primary market. The, 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 the good you're buying is brand new. Or you can buy the same car, maybe older, in the second hand market. In that case, your money goes from your bank account into the owner the, of, the, of that car, the previous owner, into his or her bank account. That is, no money goes into the maker, into the car maker, into the factory, into the, the producer. Okay, if you have this uh, clear picture of what is new and what is secondhand, if you go into the capital markets, you can find some product that is the shares, the bonds, some financial instruments that are sold in the primary market. In that case, the money goes straight to the business, to the factory, to the firm, from your bank account into the real economy. It could be for launching a new product or establishing a, a new way of doing business or how to generate energy and so on and so forth. So your money is used for do something. If you buy that share or bond in the secondary market, no money goes into the real economy. Okay, Francesco unveiled that looking to Italy, uh, the asset manager manages uh, an amount of capital of 81 billion. These 81 billion are traded every day in the capital markets. 81 billion. Is this a, a finance for changing the situation? Is, is this money useful to start up new green businesses, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to change how uh, we, we make, we, we produce energy or how we move uh, our goods and so on and so forth? The answer is no, because this money is uh, exchanged, is traded in the second hand market. Uh, the, the, the capital moves from one investor to another investor, not to the firm. So to, 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 to be more precise, uh, the, uh, the, the only instrument that in sustainable finance reach the goal to change the actual sit uh, situation, that is to start up new sustainable business or to uh, convert an existing one, you need capital to close one factory and open another one, to buy a new equipment uh, that is uh, useful for making your product uh, more uh, uh, efficient in energy consumption or they reuse the plastic and the raw materials and so on and so forth. You need money. So the firm need money and only primary markets are the, the, the channel to convey capital towards uh, uh, these needs. Now uh, I will take the second step. That is, okay, uh, do we have some data about uh, the, uh, the, the, how, many, how much capital is channeled, uh, uh, is, uh, is going into the businesses? This is the chart, this is a global market. So it's not Italy, it's not Europe, it's the, the world. Uh, if we look at the instruments used 
by firms to attract capital and uh, to, to make uh, something new. And you, you are buying or establishing new businesses thanks to the capital raised in the capital markets. The feature is from one side, a good news. So the, uh, the volume of capital attracted in the capital markets uh, is soaring, uh, totaling uh, in last year, uh, more than $700 billion. So this is the money raised in the, in the global markets to support the, uh, the, green, the green business. So it could be the, the inequity or bond. This is a technicality I will not discuss further. But this is the fraction of the real use of money from investors into businesses. And these businesses are within the, the, green, uh, uh, the green business uh, as we defined previously. Uh, it is a niche. It is a very, it is a, a less than 10% of the total daily uh, trading uh, in the capital markets. So the good news is that uh, it is soaring, but the bad news is that it's still a niche. We are talking about almost nothing if you look at the global markets. 700 billion is nothing compared to the trillion traded daily, but it is a second hand market, the, 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 the trillion capital traded daily. So uh, a, a long road uh, is it, still to, to, uh, ahead on, on, on the next futures. Again, to give you the, uh, some data, Francesco concluded that we need in Europe 260 million euro every year if you want to shut down bad businesses and start up green businesses. Again, 260 million every year. This is the size of the sustainable finance we need, but so far, the total dimension, including the second-hand market uh, managed in Italy, is only 81 billion. So uh, again, the, 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 the road towards sustainable finance is still very long. Last but not least, and then I will conclude, the third and uh, fatal step is that, uh, folks, green economy, circular, sorry, green economy uh, is a fake. Uh, is a fake news. So it's not what we need. It was written in the same year at the European Union where the Green Deal was released, namely 2019. In the same year, the European Environmental Bureau uh, released uh, this uh, report. Yeah, you can download it. Uh, it's for free, of course, uh, from the European uh, uh, Environmental Bureau. The title is uh, straightforward, decoupling debunked. Why decoupling? Because the underlining idea behind the green economy is that we can boost the economy, boost the growth of the economy, still growth, growth is in everyday policy action, everyday policy de debate, growth in the economy, but growth of a different kind in green, in, in green energy, in a sustainable energy, sustainable blah, 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 blah. But because the idea is that you can uh, pursue growth, the GDP growth, without externalities, without generating bad impact into the planet or into the people. The main idea behind the green economy, the green new deal, the green blah, 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 is, is the decoupling. That is, you can pursue growth without in negative impact on the, on the planet. Okay, this is a fake news. You cannot uh, reach the, uh, the, the growth in the green economy without having, making pressure in the planet or on the people. You can go further in, in, this, uh, in, in, in this report. I will just uh, outline you the, 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 main, uh, the main idea. That is, um, since the growth calls for production, uh, and since production so far has negative impact into people and society, the best solution if you want to benefit people and society, in society is degrowth. Less quantity, less consumption, less product, because so far, whatever is your product, your greener or, 
or light green, brown green, or whatever is your green product or social product, still we have negative impact. So I'm concluding. Uh, again, so the good news is that uh, the uh, finance to a sustainable business is soaring, but uh, the green economy is not the solution to our problems. I'm done. Thank you, Alberto. It's a bit weird for a journalist to find after uh, 50 minutes uh, already two fake news. So sustainable finance is not convenient, the first. And the second one, green economy is a fake news. I'm just joking. Just justifying my presence here. <laughs> OK. Um, apart from this, thank you, Alberto. You brought up a number of central teams I'd like to uh, come back uh, later to some of these in the panel discussion. Thanks to uh, the audience. You already um, you already started asking questions, so we'll have a good uh, Q and A session after uh, this uh, first part. And I'm sure that uh, Marco Vangelisti uh, will offer us a speech uh, in some ways resonant, resonant uh, with that of Professor Lanzavecchia, but I'm sure that he will also be able to offer us uh, further, further ideas and the results of his direct experience and the vision that he has been able to build over the years. So the word to you, uh, Marco. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, and thank you for accommodating my need to uh, present in English. So everybody had to do that. I very much appreciate that. Uh, and um, uh, Dr. Francisco uh, Bicciato talked about a cultural jump. So my presentation will invite you to take a little bit of a farther jump than we've taken so far. And for that, I will share my screen and give you a brief presentation telling you my personal story from conventional finance to what I call restorative investing. So, uh, you know, it started, uh, I studied mathematics uh, at Padua. So um, I then went to Berkeley and studied economics and finance. And the first uh, iconic construct I encounter in finance is the efficient frontier. I am not going to explain the details, but it rests on the premise that all you need to know to make an investment decision is three things. What is the risk? What is the return? And what is the liquidity of the investment? The liquidity is how fast can you convert that into cash with the understanding that the higher the return, the better, the lower the risk, the better, and the higher the liquidity, the better. And that's all you need to know to make an investment decision. This is conventional modern portfolio theory, conventional finance, right? And, you know, after studying six years of, uh, you know, abstract math and general math, uh, of course, this looked like the real world to me, right? Finally, an application of all the years I spent, uh, you know, working with symbols, but you know better, right? You know that the real world looks more like this. And in order to understand this beautiful tree, you really need to view it as embedded in a dense network of relationships. This tree that is alive is in relationship with our own breathing, is in relationship with the fungi in the soil. It's called a mycorrhizal relationship. It's in relationship with the air, with the rain, and so on. And yet, if you just look at this tree through the lens of conventional finance, this is all you can see, right? Finance only understand the commercial value of lumber, the value of the commodity. Another way of saying this is that according to conventional finance and this narrow lens, right, of boiling everything down to risk, return, and liquidity, a tree is worth more dead than alive. And it is this very point that leads us to transforming a place that looks like this into a place that looks like this. Right. This is a little bit hard to take in, and you could say various things. One is, you know, what a waste. Whatever economic benefit was derived from this operation, it couldn't possibly capture the value of what we lost. You could say, what is what an injustice. Nature uh, built this common over thousands of years, available for us, future generations, and other species, and yet this common was privatized and destroyed for the benefits of a few people. 
But from a strict financial standpoint, if you had bought this forest for $10 million and you sold the lumber for $12 million, you would have gotten a 20% return. If you did this operation in a year, but if you managed to do that within six months, you would have gotten a 40% annualized return. And if you did that within a quarter, it would have been an 80% return annualized, right? And so if you just focus on risk, return, and liquidity, the faster, the faster you can destroy the forest, the better it is for your returns. And it was this type of transformation that got me to leave the finance industry. You know, in, uh, um, I was working in 2005 through 2009, for a very well respect, uh, respected investment management firm. I was part of a team managing $20 billion in emerging markets equities. And we were the fund with the best track record worldwide over 10 years in emerging markets. We were doing great. We were quants developing quantitative models and our portfolio was doing great. The interesting thing is our uh, clients where endowments and foundations primarily, including environmental foundations. And so one year I asked myself, okay, how do we get that fantastic return that year? And it turns out that one of the best performing stocks in our portfolio was a palm oil company in Malaysia that had destroyed tens of thousands of acres of rainforest and planted a monocrop of palm oil plants in its place. And part of the reason why they did so well is because they also got a lot of carbon credits for planting trees. And this was the moment when I realized that there was a major disconnect between my personal values and what I was doing out there in the world. In fact, I even had a conversation with the chief financial officer of one of those environmental foundations. And I said, look, one of the Part of the reason why you've been so happy with us with the financial return we generated uh, is because we invested in a company that just destroyed the habitat of the orangutan in the Borneo. And uh, you know, your foundation is, was created to protect those environments. And, uh, and basically, you know, I said, is, are you not concerned about that? And he thought about it and he basically said, look, I am on the investment side and my task is to preserve the capital of the foundation in perpetuity. Notice a luxury we do not afford the 10,000 year old rainforest. And then he said, I need to generate some return uh, for the good work of the foundation protecting environments around the world, right? So you can imagine at that point, I said, okay, I can be part of this game. And I left the industry and tried to understand how you know finance, economics, and and uh, uh, the money system worked and why uh, it was giving us incentive to do something that I think is destructive in the long run. And uh, a couple of years later, I stumbled upon this uh, study that confirmed what I thought. What I realized is that the returns we were creating for our clients was subsidized by nature. We were destroyed the forest in the Borneo and planting a palm oil plants, right? And we were getting the fertility out of that soil and we would make a lot of money out of that. And so this study was published in 2013 by the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Uh, the UN basically applied environmental economic techniques to quantify in dollar terms, the value of the natural capital and the, and the ecological services that nature provides for us for free. Nature does not charge us for pollination, for clean air, for clean water, for the wood in the forests, right? And so they try to put a dollar value on water use, land use, waste, land and air pollution and greenhouse gas emission. And then they looked at what they called region sectors. This is economic activity uh, like iron and steel mills or wheat farming in a particular large region of the world, like Southern Asia, North America, Eastern Asia, and so on. And they asked the question, once we quantify in dollar terms, the amount of natural capital that was used to generate that economic activity, what, what do we find? 
And so I'm going to expand on the worst offender, which was cattle ranching and farming in South America, used $312 billion in natural capital, mostly by destroying the forest, um, by uh, basically burning, creating greenhouse gases, uh, polluting the air and the water. And this is to generate 16 $0.6 billion of revenues, not profits, right? Revenues. So we're taking something for free that was valued way more than what we were selling. Uh, so if you had to pay the real price of a hamburger, it would cost you 10 euros to eat a hamburger at McDonald's, right? If you had to pay for the real price. And so the top 20 impact region sectors used 3.2 trillion dollars of natural capital to generate 2.4 trillion dollars of revenues. None of them would have been profitable if they accounted for their use of natural capital. And the top thousand region sectors, this is basically accounting for more than 90% of the total economic activity on planet Earth in 2009, used 7.3 trillion dollars worth of unpriced natural capital. So let's put this number in context because it's, it's hard to think in trillions. How much is $7 trillion? Well, the world GDP in 2009 was 70 trillions, right? And the growth rate in the prior five years, there were very fast growth. In 2009, actually GDP contracted because of the financial crisis, but even at a very fast clip, the global economy grows at around you know, three to 5%. So in other words, we were using a tremendous subsidies for our uh, economic growth by taking natural capital and destroying it and converting it into economic activity. And at the end of the day, financial returns. So we humans are treating nature as a business in liquidation. And I think this point relates to what Alberto was saying that uh, you know, economic growth, even if we call it green, is still being heavily subsidized by the destruction of the natural capital. So uh, at the bottom here, I have traditional investments ranked by risk and return, going from you know, very secure investments in CDs at a bank to venture capital, let's say. And uh, uh, finance has a dirty secret, and that is, its origin is drenched in blood. Uh, there is a, this great book just came out, David McNally, Blood and Money, War, Sl Slavery, Finance and Empire. What you find is that the origin of finance is really linked to the slave trade and the um, basically war planter. Uh, the same argument is done in debt, the first 5,000 years by David Graeber. Or if you look chapter 16 of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, a beautiful book, what you can see is that finance uh, basically was responsible for the uh, colonial expansion worldwide and the uh, tremendous uh, amount of slave trading in the last uh, three centuries. So there is a pretty dirty secret, which is finance is primarily extracted. So if you don't know where your money is, chances are it's extracting either from the natural uh, capital or from people. So what I'm claiming is that we need to add a new dimension, you know, not only risk, return and liquidity, but we need also to add the awareness dimension, meaning we need to understand where our money is. And I'm saying if you're investing through mutual funds or other products, you, you're probably unaware what your money is doing out there and chances are it's extracting from others. So the first step is aware investing. And I think Alberto was referring a little bit to that. When you're providing capital in the primary market to companies, you are aware of where the money goes, right? It goes to particular activities and you can say, yes, this is a a uh, good renewable project or something that is done in a particular way. A secondary market is a little bit tricky because um, large corporations are trading in the secondary market and it's hard to know their operations and how they treat workers and how they interface with the natural environment. 
But the next step is go to no harm investing. So not, you know, you might be aware, let's imagine you buy shares of Apple, right? They make beautiful phones and computers and you can say, well, I'm aware where my money is, is in Apple. Cool. Now the question is, is that a no harm investment? So of course, all, uh, Apple is not a weapon manufacturer, is not a tobacco company, is not, let's say a SIM stock, but one could say, well, you know, they make phones and beautiful computers. So that's no harm. Or you can look a little bit more closely and realize that their business model is based on electronic obsolescence. So every year you have to buy a new phone and you have to dispose of the old phone generating tremendous amount of electronic waste, or you can peer a little bit into their supply chain and look at uh, Foxcom and how workers are treated there. And you might decide, well, you know, maybe Apple is not exactly a no harm investment. Now, the next step in my taxonomy is what I call positive investing. This is an investment where you know where the money is, you know it's doing no harm, and it's trying to solve an environmental or social problem, but still has a positive risk adjusted return. So you actually expect your capital back with a return that could be concessionary. It should, you know, could be a smaller return than otherwise expected. But there's another category that I really like. And uh, if it is true that finance has done tremendous amount of damage and extraction from the natural environment and from people, uh, over time, then there is a role for capital that puts in more than it takes out. And that's the idea of restorative investing, which is at the interface of philanthropy and investing. So these are investment in things that really need to happen. Uh, it's aware, no harm, it's trying to solve an environmental or social problem, but the risk adjusted return is negative. And this is really a new space and I want to give you a couple of examples. First, uh, let me say that when we talk about ethical finance, really, in my view, it needs to be no harm investing, positive investing, or restorative investing. And these are the only types of investing that is compatible with a circular economy, in my view. Now, one example of a non-extractive finance and uh, this is certainly a positive investment, is something called Seed Commons. Seed Commons in the United States is a network of cooperative mutual funds that are investing in workers-owned cooperatives. And so the way it works is that you provide the capital, they give it to uh, the local funds that uh, collectively decide which worker-owned cooperatives should be funded, there is an agreement with the cooperatives that they would share the uh, part of the profit they generate with the fund. And then the fund retains 2% for its operations because they also provide technical assistance to the various cooperatives. And if there is something else uh, on top of that, that's get distributed to the investors. So the investors are the last one in line to get paid and they're not calling the shots. Not only that, if capital is provided to those um, uh, cooperatives, the only collateral that is asked for is collateral bought with the investment capital, right? This is unlike a lot of loans where you borrow to uh, an entrepreneur, you lend to an entrepreneur, but then you say you have to put your house up for collateral, right? So that's a collateral that was not purchased with the money provided. So this is an example in my view of non-extractive finance and of a positive investment. But I also want to give you an idea of this new space of restorative investing. And I've been uh, uh, one of the founding member of Slob Money, which is this movement to take money from Wall Street and put it to work locally to support the fertility of the soil. So the idea is that to restore the fertility of the soil, close to where you live by investing in food and farming enterprises close to home. And again, this is a wonderful book. The, um, the foreword is by Carlo Petrini, uh, who is the founder of Slow Food. Uh, you might uh, have heard about him. So I would highly recommend you take a look at this book. But I also want to present you with probably 
the most exciting and courageous investment management firm I know. This is Cordata Capital. And uh, you'll see in the next slides why I think they're really brave. And another thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is resource generation and their new transformative investment principles that have been released uh, early this month after a three year process. So resource generation is a network of uh, rich inheritors. These are kids, young people that have inherited a lot of money and realize that a lot of the money they received was obtained in ways that was extractive. And they are committing to redistributing their wealth, power and land in a way that is just. So it's a fabulous group and they just came up with this transformative investment principles and uh, you will see the links in my presentation and this will be available to you. But let me talk about Cordata Capital <laughs> and why I think they are really amazing. And uh, we're talking about this, this cultural jump that I'm hoping uh, we take a little bit uh, farther than we've, we've had so far. Uh, this from their website, we are an anti-capitalist wealth management firm with a commitment to support clients in redistributing rather than continuing to accumulate wealth. We believe the most strategic role for wealth investors in transforming our economy is divesting from Wall Street and shifting their money into community controlled investments that center racial and economic justice. So this is very exciting. As you may imagine, they have 50 million under management and these are all rich kids that want to learn how to use the money to repair the damage finance has done in the last centuries. So uh, these are the resources and links of the things I mentioned. This is the study, natural capital at risk, the top 100 externalities of businesses, showing that we're using $7 trillion worth of natural capital every year to subsidize our economic growth and at the end of the day, our financial returns. Seed Commons is that uh, positive investment I mentioned. This is the uh, website of Slomani Cordata Capital. And this is the link to the transformative investment principles of resource generation. And I don't have the time to go into them right now uh, because I would like to leave plenty of room for Q&A. You can also check my website and uh, I have there some um, you know, information about the large systems. For example, very few people know that the collapse uh, in the financial system in 2007, 2008 was due to the collapse of the shadow banking system. Very few people understand about banking and fewer understand about shadow banking. And there is also a course that I'm teaching starting in fact, uh, next Monday. It's called Towards Aware and No Harm Investing. If you're curious to um, learn a little bit more about this new space. So that's uh, what I had to share. And uh, I hope we have some time now for Q&A. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. We do. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much for having presented us a new taxonomy of investments and for the examples you brought. Uh, yes, we have time for a Q&A session. We have already a question I will start with, but um, I just want to remember that you can uh, ask your question uh, with the chat, um, the Zoom chat. Uh, I saw that Valeria de Grandis raised her hand. Please, Valeria, use the chat to ask your question. Uh, I would start with uh, Manu Kipenge Muelva. Sorry if I misspelled the name. Um, that uh, puts um, a good theme, in my opinion, and a theme that um, puts together uh, contents from Marco and Alberto. It's a theme of uh, knowledge. Um, I read the question, what is your point of view about the, it refers to Francesco's um, uh, underlining the growth of um, sustainable finance. So what is your point of view about the increase of, fund, of funds from December uh, 2019 to December 2020? Uh, are people seeking for profit opportunity or people getting conscious 
of sustainability topics. So the, 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 the theme is uh, about um, knowledge and um, awareness of investors. And my personal uh, question is also, is this a trade-off, profit versus um, consciousness? Uh, Alberto, if you want to start. Yeah, the, the growing data on sustainable um, and responsible investing that probably shows that uh, at least the people are not or no longer willing to take profit from uh, from damages uh, at large so you can uh, you can gain a profit uh, even on on the second hand market uh, that is the, the, the secondary market in the capital market uh, if at least uh, you are gaining a profit from a share uh, issued maybe many years ago uh, by a company who is not arming uh, the planet or who is not arming people. So to be, to be, to be positive, uh, looking at uh, those data, I, I would say yes, at least people are now uh, trying to, uh, to limit their profit uh, generation only from, uh, from, uh, from equities, from Generally, securities, generally speaking, uh, issued uh, by uh, uh, sustainable firms. But if you are willing to make a change, even if you want to restore or to, uh, to recover the damages made by the business as usual, that data are not useful because you are investing uh, in a second-hand market. Your money goes into... Uh, and other investors and the investors are going to sell the shares to other investors, but uh, we, we are moving money uh, from and to investors, not from investors to people, to uh, companies, to co co cooperatives like Marco uh, clearly uh, uh, outlined in, uh, in his speech. So if we want to make a change, we need uh, uh, instruments that goes into people, into firms, into, fac into factories. And this is not the, the second hand the capital market. So the, the data uh, showed by uh, Francesco uh, previously. We'll go back to this uh, aspect about changing the approach from secondary to, to primary market. But first, I want to hear about uh, this, the, the, the previous question from Marco. Uh, whether there is a trade-off between, well, you know, I'm looking at the big picture and because uh, I'm a mathematician, right? So uh, how fast does financial capital want to grow? What is a return that people expect, right? You look at that chart and you say, okay, great. The market went up 10%, 12%. So whatever number you have in mind, compare that to the rate at which the global GDP grows. And you'll find out that the number is way higher than the GDP growth, right? Nobody invests in the market expecting a 3% return. And yet a 3% economic growth would be pretty good. What does that mean? it means the larger and larger share of economic value is being claimed by the owners of capital. And that's where you have the continuous concentration of wealth into the hands of the few. So when we're saying, you know, is it uh, green investing more or less profitable? I'm basically saying, look, if the financial capital as a whole is growing faster than the, the economy, what you know for sure is you're extracting from it. And what I showed you with that study of the UN, what we know is that we're extracting from nature. Like if, if we had to operate within extra, without extracting from nature, uh, our, we would be probably in a degrowth environment at this point. Uh, or you know the growth will be only in intellectual things. I mean, obviously, if you increase the salary of all professors, let's say, right? Uh, you're increasing the GDP without uh, requiring more material to flow through the economy. So that's, that's my big question. So uh, in general, I would say it's a little bit harder to generate financial returns in a fair way. 
And the way it's fair is to say the capital I'm providing, it's creating economic value, and I take a fair share of it, not the majority or more than the economic value generated by my investment. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I want to remember that the University of Padova launched a master's degree in sustainable chemistry and technologies for circular economy. Uh, the master's degree provides an extensive and highly interdisciplinary interdiscipline training program for professionals to be employed in companies or public bodies applying a circular economy model to production and services. Uh, and let's stay on the um, awareness field. How do you guys assess the degree of awareness on ethical finance uh, issues, even in specialized operators? Yeah, uh, actually, the, the University of Padova uh, is part of um, a research network uh, on sustainable finance. Uh, it is a European funded project. And uh, at the core of this uh, program is also to assess uh, uh, to what extent uh, the managers, both in firms and in the universities, are aware about the sustainable teams uh, and how do they manage their firm, could be in industry or the university in this regard. Uh, the, the research is still ongoing, so I don't have a clear picture about that. But uh, I would argue that uh, if I look at universities or if I look at uh, business school uh, after universities, or uh, if I look at uh, conferences in the business community, the, 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 the jump towards a, a change in uh, how people uh, are looking at the, the consequences of their decision, whether it is in the financial market or within the firm, still is not uh, uh, based on the consciousness of the consequences of our actions. Uh, Marco and, and Vailder, for example, uh, uh, what it, it is behind a, a, a very well famous uh, cream of nuts, or basically it is a, a, a sugar uh, with the oil and some nuts that you can uh, uh, spread over a slice of bread. When you buy that uh, cream of uh, sugar, oil, and nuts, you are not aware uh, that that oil comes from deforestation. Again, when you buy your, uh, uh, your mor mortadella uh, pani sandwich, uh, you are not aware that that pig has been uh, uh, fed by soya that comes from the deforestation in Amazonia. So again, that is to say, uh, uh, for me, for my, at the best of my knowledge, people are still not aware about the consequences of their uh, daily uh, decision on, uh, on market, whether it is the, 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 the goods or service or the financial market. If I look, if this is true, the, the change we need to, to, to go towards a sustainable business, a sustainable environment, prosperity is very, very long. Marco, your last name, Vangelisti, uh, suggests me that you have some ways to spread the good news about financial um, uh, ethics, ethics in financial. But um, a part of it, um, I feel that, that there is a generational theme uh, and that the people uh, that still has to to be made to be aware, be made aware uh, are the, the, the elder, the, the same ones that take took profit from uh, the traditional market. Right. Well, you know, uh, I think it, it really is important. And that's why I've been addressing the owners of capital in the last uh, couple of years with my work, uh, because somebody had a comment and said the fourth uh, uh, dirty secret is that CEO cannot work in Italy, you know. And so, if you're yeah. if you're saying, look at how difficult it is to run a business, and then if you say you can only run it in a, and you have additional uh, limitations, right? Because then you cannot use uh, source something that is uh, um, unethically sourced. You have to pay your workers well. You have to do this. You have to. 
Now, where does that demand come from? An expectation of financial returns. That if you reduce the expectation of what the capital should generate, there is more room to operate for everybody. Uh, and until we get to a place where we put a price on nature and or on exploiting workers and uh, uh, businesses will have to factor that in in their bottom line the only bottom line that investors see is the you know euro or dollar uh, bottom line and so of course there is an incentive to cut corners to pay workers less to not uh, spend the extra money to clean up after yourself so that's why I'm, I'm, I think it's very important to start from the expectations of investors. And the other thing I want to say to people is uh, we cannot be perfect, okay? So, uh, you know, we, we cannot have a no impact life. You know, every choice we make, uh, there are compromises, but we can do our little part. And so, you know, for example, I'm not a vegan, but the only meat I eat is, you know, animals I know by name, you know, it's like they're on the farm and they know what they're doing out there. They're helping restoring the fertility of the soil. So uh, in, in other words, um, we cannot be too harsh on ourselves. but the idea of becoming aware at least of our investments, I think that's something we can do. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm suggesting people consider. Yeah, right. Um, Alberto, I, I want to go back to the theme of um, dimensions uh, um, you brought to this table. Um, if we consider uh, sustainable financial instruments uh, uh, linked to big works, uh, such as infrastructural ones, uh, we see some instruments uh, that are gradually establishing uh, and that are uh, like, I'm thinking, for instance, to green bonds. Uh, but if we change the size and we go small, uh, it begins to be difficult to find suitable financial instruments. Uh, am I wrong? Yes or no, because um, uh, the, the first question is uh, the role of um, connecting uh, small farmers like the, mm. the farming uh, uh, Marco is uh, call, uh, calling uh, with his uh, everyday life. So the small farming, the small entrepreneurs, sustainable ones, of course, and uh, the general public of investors. So the role played uh, to, to, to connect these two uh, people is made by the banks. So here comes the ethical banks' big questions. So I agree with you that uh, to change the infrastructure, to change the, the big projects, the big companies, capital markets are the, the place where uh, the, those companies can find the capital needed to, 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 to grow or to start up their own sustainable business. But if, if we look at small farmers, small cooperatives, small businesses, sustainable, of course, they cannot have access to capital markets because of the size they need for their activities. Here comes the, 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 the need of a sustainable or alternative ethical banks. In Italy, we have uh, at least uh, uh, three ethical banks uh, that uh, are a member of the Euro European Federation of Ethical Banks. But again, if we look at their balance sheet, so the, the, the volume of capital traded, <laughs> it is a niche within the niche within the niche. So, uh, there are room for uh, improvement uh, for banks. But the good news is that the uh, internet uh, somehow uh, bypassed the, the typical uh, role of banks that, that was connecting small entrepreneurs with the large public of investors or retailer of, uh, depositors because with the crowdfunding uh, people can directly uh, uh, convey and, and invest capital directly into the business maybe they they know where they are or because they 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 they, they, they are aware where the money goes so 
uh, we, we wait for a long time, the, 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 the raising up of the number of ethical banks. The number is still fixed at a couple of three, four ethical banks throughout Italy and uh, uh, 17 throughout uh, uh, Europe, nothing. But again, the good news might be the, the role of crowdfunding, crowd lending, so where people can be uh, directly connect to the, 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 the final destination of their capital. Let's wait and see. So it's definitely time to take action. Okay, it seems like our time is almost up. Marco, do you have to add anything to this theme? No, I mean, what I've seen, at least in the United States, is a relaxation of securities laws to um, allow for more participation by regular folks in the capital market. And so these are, you know, the Jobs Act, uh, the Reg CF and DPOs. These are all ways for entrepreneurs to offer their securities to the general public without doing a, an, an IPO and spend millions of dollars in legal fees. So um, I don't know what's going on in uh, in Europe in that regard, but certainly that's one way to start democratizing the um, uh, access to in direct investing on the part of regular folks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, our time is up. Uh, everybody are kindly asked to respond to the survey, which will appear uh, in a few on the screen. Here it is. Um, I want to thank Francesco Bicciato for his introductory speech, and especially I want to thank Alberto Lanzavecchi and Marco Vangelisti, who contributed so richly to make us understand a little better the role of ethical finance in this path uh, from profit to prosperity. Thanks to um, alumni and amici dell'Università degli Studi di Padova for giving me the opportunity to share this evening with you and for learning something new uh, today. So good evening, everybody, and see you next time. Thank Thanks you. Again. Thank you all. Thank you, thank all. you Domenico, for uh, uh, facilitating this. And thank you, Alberto. Good to meet you. I hope to meet you again, because uh, we, we share the same view about finance. And I guess also the story, but this, we will discuss later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Thank you, Marco. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.